I want to welcome you again to another installation of our new sermon series called Just Pray It. I hope that so far what you have heard last week as we talked about the anatomy of prayer has blessed you. And in that sermon, I tried to help us to understand the purpose of prayer, why prayer should actually happen, and it should happen because it should bring us closer to God. Prayer is for proximity to God. And it's important for us to understand that there are several dynamics that go into this desire to be close to God. First of all, our attitude towards people will affect our altitude with God. You will need to learn to treat people right if your prayers are going to touch God at his altitude. You need to have certitude, believing that God will actually do something with your prayers. You will need fortitude to pray even when it's painful and it's hard. You will need quietude, quietitude. That is, find a place where you can go to God and be with him alone. And finally, I said you need habitude. That is, prayer should happen all of the time. And so I gave the anatomy of prayer last week, and I hope that blessed you. And something that I've started to do for this month of October is that the topic that we discuss on Sabbath is going to go is going is going to be discussed in depth on Wednesday. And last week we had Sister Lika. She helped us to understand the anatomy of prayer from a more in-depth uh, perspective. We discussed it. We got into it. So if you want to know more uh, from this topic that I'm going to present today and you just want to get a little bit deeper, this Wednesday you have an opportunity to do that. Because, hey, for the time that I have, I can't talk about everything in the text, in the passage. So join us for Just Pray It in-depth edition next Wednesday for for midweek. But today I want to jump into our text of of preaching. And I've taken it from James chapter 5 and verse number 13. For a little bit of context is that these words of James are given at the concluding section of his letter. And it's very interesting because the last words that James talks about, they are about prayer. So in fact, he's saying, after all you have read, the important thing that I want you to focus on is on prayer. And I love that. So let's go to James chapter 5 and verse number 13. And I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. This is what it says. Is anyone among you suffering? Mm-hmm. Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praises. Here James presents two emotional states, uh, suffering and cheerfulness. And he's saying when you're suffering, pray about it. When you're cheerful, you need to sing about it. Then he continues, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders of the church and let them, watch this, pray over him or her anointing him or her with oil in the name of the Lord. Right here, this is what James is saying. If you're in an emotional state of suffering or sickness or there's a challenge, your answer to that is prayer. That's beautiful. Notice what he says, developing this idea a little bit more. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. Prayer saves, y'all, and you need to have fortitude or rather certitude when you pray and the Lord will not might or should but the Lord will raise him up and if he has committed sins he will he will be forgiven that's what prayer is able to do y'all but this is what I want you to concentrate on the last three verses that I'm going to read therefore based on your confession and the prayer of faith and you want to be healed and raised up. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Oh, I love this. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I love how the NIV puts this statement. It says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. For me, that reads a little bit better. Now, here's where I want you to pay attention to. Elijah, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. 
<laughs> Just think about that for a moment. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That is why I want to preach a sermon this morning. A nature like yours. A nature like yours. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And it did not rain for three years and six months on the earth. Then he prayed again. Prayer, you got to do it again. He prayed again and he heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. Let us pray. Speak, O God, in Jesus' name. Amen. In the world of chess, none is more famous than Tani Adewumi. Tane Adewumi comes from North Nigeria. He fled North Nigeria because of Boko Haram and he migrated to the United States. In a new country, no place to go, he settled, he and his family, in a homeless shelter. When he enrolled in school at PS116, he signed up for the local or the, 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 the common or local chess club in his school. And so he migrated to New York in 2017 and started playing chess in 2017. And now in 2019, he won the New York State Championship of Chess. And by winning this championship, Tani and his family moved from a homeless shelter and they got an apartment in Manhattan. And not only that, they had a lot of contributions from other people. And now Tani and his family, they are now living a better life. At the age of 11, Tani is a national master of chess in the U.S. And he's the 28th youngest person to ever do that. And he's aiming to be one of the youngest grandmasters. And the youngest grandmaster is 12. And he's aiming to be the youngest grandmaster. And today, everyone is talking about Tani. You see, we live in a world of superstars. These people that rise above the crowd, that are able to persevere in tough circumstances, and become something great in life. And Tani is a superstar in the world of chess. And I know that they are superstars in your world. You love certain movie superstars. You love certain political superstars. You love certain spiritual superstars. But here is the good news. When it comes to prayer, there are no superstars. Anyone can pray effectively. And this is what James is saying in James chapter number 5, verse 17 and 18. This is what James is saying. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again and heaven gave rain and the earth bore its fruit. The Bible is saying through James, though we treat Elijah like a biblical superstar, but we should not look at him as a biblical superstar. We need to look at Elijah just like any one of us. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. This Ex, uh, expression in, in the Greek language is, uh, it, it, it denotes this idea. Uh, this, it, it, it denotes the idea of something that comes from a larger category. Track with me for a moment. So uh, this is what James is saying. Elijah comes from the larger category of human beings. Yes, he is a superstar in terms of faith. He's a superstar in terms of spirituality, but before he was a superstar, he came from the a larger category of humanity. And even though he's a superstar, he is still a part of humanity. And that's what you need to look at every superstar in your life as. 
They may be a political superstar. They may be a spiritual superstar. They may be a movie superstar. They may be a sports superstar. But their superstardom does not separate them from the larger category of humanity. And this is to help us to understand the fact that every human being is the same. Even though they have a position, even though they have prestige, they are the same. They, they, they breathe the same air. They see the same sun. They sweat the same sweat. They stink the same body odor. They go to the bathroom and they do business in the bathroom just like any human being. They are just like everybody. They are, uh, they, they are on, a, on a higher pedestal, but their higher pedestalness does not separate them from the category of humanity. The point of James is that when you look at Elijah, he was a man with limitations. He was a man with weaknesses. Yet this man with limitations was able to pray beyond his limitations and weaknesses. And his prayer had effectivity and he had power. And you can do the same thing because they are no superstars when it comes to prayer. Anyone can pray effectively. I don't know if I'm speaking to you right now. I hope you can understand and know that your prayer is just as, as effective as anyone else in this world. No one's prayer is higher than your prayer because everyone prays from the same vantage point. Everyone prays from the same foundation and that foundation is humanity with its weaknesses, humanity with its challenges, humanity with its difficulties, humanity with all of its pain, humanity with all of its discouragement, humanity with all of its mess, humanity with all of its trials, humanity with everything that's wrong with humanity. Everyone prays from that vantage point. Everyone Everyone prays from the vantage point of temptation. Everyone prays from the vantage point of wanting to give up. Everyone prays from the vantage point of, I don't want to do this anymore. That's what you need to understand when you pray. You are coming to God with your humanity and anyone else who prays is coming to God in their humanity. No one is special. No one is unique. Elijah was a man with a nature like you and I, but yet he prayed and it did not rain for three years. There are no superstars in prayer. Last Sunday, one of our leaders in JCC texted in our leaders group and says, there's somebody we need to pray for. And so a number of us got together for a prayer call. And I asked this leader, I said, so what is our game plan for prayer? And he says, uh, she says to me, well, obviously, pastor, you're going to pray. You are the pastor. And that's how many of you treat me. And I'm grateful. Pastor, you're the pastor. You pray. Your prayer has effectivity. But I switched it up. I said, before, uh, we spoke in, in the prayer call. And then I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. All of us who are leaders are going to pray. And that's what we did. All of us prayed. Because I wanted the, the sick person to understand that all of us praying together are more powerful than one person praying alone. And I wanted my leaders to also understand that your prayer is just as effective as my prayer because all of us are coming from the same vantage ground. And that's what I want somebody to take to heart this morning, that do not underestimate or devalue your prayers because you do not think you're spiritual enough, because you do not think you're capable enough, because you don't have a position in the church, because you, you have been struggling in specific sin, because you have spoken negatively to somebody. Do not allow that to limit you, but understand that humanity has limitations, humanity has weaknesses, but we can pray and be so effective even as Elijah was effective because there are no superstars in prayer. They're just people who pray. Hallelujah, somebody. They're just people who pray. Hallelujah, somebody. They're just people who pray. Hallelujah, somebody. You see, I've understood something reading the book of Ray Dalio called Principles. You have to pick up this book. It's fantastic. And Ray Dalio said something that just made my mind go bonkers. I was like, wow, this is, this is good. I, I like this. He says, when people spend your money, they're not careful to spend your money. And he said this because he understood one factor or two factors. Number one, 
it's not their money. Number two, people are not going to spend a lot of energy bargaining on your behalf because it's not their money. Now, I want you to take that into prayer. When people pray for you, they're not going to be as careful to pray for you because it's not their concern. Oh, I'm helping somebody right now. It's not their concern. Therefore, they will pray for you, but they will not pray for you as deeply as they need to because it is not their concern. Another reason is they tend to forget. And therefore, it is important for you to pray on your behalf because nobody can represent your concerns as well as you can represent them before God because no one is experiencing your challenges. No one is going through what you're going through. Are you feeling me? No one is experiencing your doubt right now. No one is experiencing discouraging right, discouragement right now. No one is in that marital difficulty. No one is in that ailment in your body. No one is in that work challenge. No one is in that parent difficulty. No one is in that uh, son and, and, and father difficulty. No one is in that. It is you who is in that. And therefore, you are at the best place to bring your concerns to God because you understand it better. You see it better. And therefore, it is important that you pray for your be for on your behalf and represent yourself understanding first and foremost that that no one is going to represent me properly and that there are no spiritual superstars there are no prayer superstars all i need to do is to go to god and pray on my behalf for myself elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed and it did not rain for three years now, now, the truth of the matter is, I've never prayed a prayer that caused a drought to come. Are you feeling what I'm saying? Uh, my point is that a lot of us, though we, are, though we are human like Elijah, yet we do not pray as effectively as Elijah. Lamborghini and Ferrari are top of the line when it comes to luxury vehicles. Now, when you compare... Lamborghinis and Ferraris to Fords and Toyotas, you see that there's a difference. Lamborghinis and Ferraris are more expensive and only a few, a few own them. Whereas Fords and Toyotas, many own them. In fact, when you go through Jakarta, to Avanzas and Calias and uh, uh, Camrys and, and, and Corollas, you know, uh, Lexuses everywhere. Now, do you know what separates Lamborghinis and Ferraris from Toyotas and Fords? What separates them is Ferraris and Lamborghinis made a choice long time ago that we are not going to mass produce our cars. We're going to make them unique and special. If anyone wants to get one of our cars, they will need to rise up to our level. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, when we look at prayer, some prayers are like Lamborghinis and Ferraris, whereas other prayers are like Toyotas and Fords. Do you know what separates them? What separates them is righteousness. That's the difference. You see, when, 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 when Elijah or James is talking about Elijah, he's using Elijah as an example to a principle that he de he's developing at the end of verse number 16. Notice what he says in verse number 16 at the very end. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Then he says, Elijah was a man like us, right? So he's saying, if you want to know an example of a righteous person, look at Elijah. Yet he was a man with a nature like ours, but yet he prayed, watch this, yet he prayed and it was effective because he was a righteous person. And therefore his prayer was effective because of his righteousness. So the difference between an effective prayer and an effective prayer is righteousness. And righteousness is a desire to live your life according to an established, defined standard. Oh, don't miss what I'm saying righteousness is a desire to live your life according to a, de a defined standard of, 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 of 
a divine, a defined standard, a defined standard. Oh, that was hard to get out of my mouth. Lord, help me. We are in an age, watch me now. We are in an age in which we have to follow certain standards if we want to interact publicly. We're in an age where we have to use the Peduli Lindungi app when we go to the mall. I said that correctly. I'm proud of myself, y'all. We have to use the app. We have to scan before we can enter. And that shows that we have been vaccinated. And in fact, most of us have, are getting those vaccinations. We must jaga jarak. We must wear our mask. And any one of us who is following those standards is a righteous person. Are you following what I'm saying? Any person who is following those standards is a righteous person. And therefore, a righteous person decides that I'm going to live my life according to established, defined standards. In the biblical sense, righteousness is dependent on living your life according to the standards of God. So, for example, if you decide to give back your 10 percent after you get your check, you can consider yourself a righteous person. If you decide, watch me now, if you decide to save yourself and not spend yourself before marriage, you are a righteous person. If you decide to eat properly according to the definitions of a good diet in the Bible, you are a righteous person. If you decide to reconcile with your brother after you've been offended by him, or by your sister, you can be considered a righteous person. If you help the poor and give back to the hungry, you can consider yourself a righteous person. Why? Because you are living your life based upon the standards that have been defined by God. And therefore, by living your life based upon that, those standards, you are a righteous person. Hallelujah, somebody. You choosing to worship worship God on Sabbath and not go out and, and, and spend money and, and do things that uh, just only bring pleasure to yourself, but actually serve God on Sabbath and connect with other believers, you can consider yourself a righteous person because you're living your life based upon the standards that God has set. I was checking out the, the news and I discovered something unique and, and, and special uh, that the OED, or the Oxford English Dictionary is the standard or the authority on the English language. And they get to define, watch me now, they get to define new words in the English language. And recently, because of the Korean influence, they have added 26 new words from the Korean culture into the English language. And the Oxford English Dictionary can do that because they are considered the authority and the standard on the English language. You and I cannot put together standards on the English language because we are not an authority. Check this. You see, God is an authority on everything human. God created us. He created the world. He put in us his image. He decided to send his son to die on our behalf. And therefore, because of that, he has the ability, he has the authority, and he has the right to define the standard of life in our experience. And therefore, you and I have the obligation to live our life based upon the standards that God has set. I don't know if I'm helping somebody right now. You and I don't get to define the standards of righteousness. You and I don't get to define the standard of what is right or wrong. God is the one who defines that. And therefore, when God has asked you, give me back your 10% and you choose not to give it back. Guess what? You are breaking his standard. And in that sense, you are being unrighteous. When you decide to give your body before you're married, in that instance, you're being unrighteous because you're breaking his standard. When you decide to remain and reconcile to your brother or your sister. In that instance, you are being unrighteous. When you decide not to give to the poor, in that instance, you are being unrighteous. Now you may tell me, Pastor, I have every reason. I have every right not to give my 10%. That's up to you. And it may make sense to you. And I get that. 
But the question is, are you the definer of standard standards or is God the definer of standard? You might say, you know what, pastor, I want to try it out. I want to try the car before I get married. I want to see if it really works. And you might have good reason to do that. But the question is, are you the one who defines standard or is it God? You might say, you know what? They hurt me so bad. It was so difficult. How could they do that to me? Therefore, I'm I'm not going to reconcile to them. And you may be right. But the question is, are you the one who defines standards or is God who defines standards? You might say, I'm not going to give money to the poor. Anyway, there are these people in Jakarta who use the less fortunate to to do a business for them. And they keep taking money from us. And I don't like that. Therefore, I'm not going to give any more. But the question is, are you the one who defines the standard or is it God who defines the standard? And brother and sister, let me let me be clear with you. You may have good reasons for doing what you want to do. But the question is, are those reasons in alignment with God? Are they in alignment with his purpose and his standards and his wishes and his will? And if they are, then I want you to know that you're in a safe place. But if they are not, you are in an unsafe place. And in that instance, you are living in an unrighteous state. And if you're in that state, your prayers are going to be ineffective. Your prayers are not going to make a difference. Uh, That is why confession is important. That is why we are to go before God and let him know what's wrong in us. We are to go before God to tell him what's happening. Because those things that are wrong actually become like static to our prayers. They break the Wi-Fi connection with God. Now, now you see, I I don't want to paint the picture that righteousness is perfection. Because I love the example of Elijah, because Elijah, watch me now, Elijah was very imperfect. In fact, one time Jezebel scared the living hell out of Elijah. The brother was scared. He, it, it was just, it was, it was bad. He ran away and he ran into a cave and he said, oh God, God, I want to die because there's nobody who is faithful like me. He wanted to quit. And Elijah had so many challenges. You understand what I'm saying? He has so many difficulties and and, and these kind of things. So Elijah wasn't a perfect person. And that's good news today. That righteousness is not perfection. You understand what I'm saying? Righteousness doesn't give you the card that, that you are perfect. No. But the beautiful thing about righteousness is that a righteous person, though not perfect, is a person who knows how to make things right when they're wrong. That's what a righteous person is. And this is why James says in verse number 16, before he says the prayer of a righteous man is effective. Notice what he says. This is what he says. He says, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Then he says, the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Which tells me is that a righteous person is not a perfect person, but a righteous person is a person who knows how to make it right when it has gone wrong. Hallelujah, somebody. A righteous person knows how to make it right when it has gone wrong. And that's what you need to understand today, that if you are to pray effectively, you need to be able to make things right. You need to be able to own and take responsibility for whatever has gone wrong in your life. Whatever is challenging you, whatever is demanding out of you, however huge you have messed up, however bad you got into it. I want you to understand that today you can confess about it that today you can make it right and once you make it right guess what you attain your righteous card again that you stand right with God again that you and God are now good again and that is good news today that you can live a righteous life not because you are perfect but because you understand that I can use the power of confession that I can use the power of coming back to God and making things right and when I I I, I earn that and I use that, then I can still maintain my righteousness. Hallelujah, somebody. And that's what I love about the Christian life because God knows that we are weak. God knows that we have challenges. God knows that we make mistakes. God knows that every day we are not the same. God knows that some days we're more emotional than others. God knows that some days some of us are experiencing a change in moods and attitude. God knows that our we're not always steady and that sometimes we can say the wrong thing. 
And that sometimes we can do the wrong thing. And that sometimes we can act in a way that is inconsistent with the gospel. That sometimes we can do things that bring shame to the name of God. But in those seasons, God doesn't back away from us. In those seasons, God draws closer to us. And he wants us to know, my son, you have messed up. My daughter, it ain't right. My daughter, we got to get back. And when we recognize that we're in a season in which we're not right with God and we go back to him and we confess, then we make it right. In fact, this is what the text says. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. You see right here. And I want to talk to somebody right now and I'm going to challenge somebody right now because because you know what? For me, I've discovered something. It's easy for me to give back my 10 my 10% every month. It's easy for me to save my body before marriage. It's easy for me not to drink alcohol. It's easy for me to um to give to the poor. But you know what's not easy? It's for me to recognize that I'm wrong. You feel what I'm saying? And when you confess as James says, which is the tool to make it right, he is saying and when you confess, which is a tool to make it right, I find that so difficult because it is counter-human to recognize that we are wrong. And some of us, it's a lot easier for us to go to church and serve in church than to say, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. For some of us, saying sorry is like we are, we are pregnant and we have to push it out of us. You feel? Me? Some of us have a hard time to recognize that I'm wrong. In fact, I've, I've understood that here in, 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 in Indonesia, it's very, it's, re, it's disrespectful to tell someone who is older that they are wrong. But according to the Bible, the Bible says it's not, it's not the way. We have to be able to know when we are wrong and recognize it and confess it. Some of us need to confess to somebody that we did wrong. Mm -hmm. We need to go back and say, I'm sorry. I did it. I'm sorry. I messed up. Because it is more important to make sure you are right than to be right. Please understand what I'm saying. It is more important to make sure you are right than to be right. You know, to be right is that idea that I'm never wrong. I'm going to prove my point. I'm going to argue it out. And, and some people like to do that. They like to argue about faith to prove that their faith is the right one. Some people like to argue that they have the best opinions. Some people like to argue that they're the best leader. Some people like to argue that they're best in this and that. They want to be right. But I want you to understand that, that being right is not as important as making sure that you are right. And making sure that you're right is the understanding to know that whatever I'm doing right here is the right thing. What that means is this. Please don't miss me. Making sure that you're right will actually call you to actually do investigation about yourself. You might need to talk to somebody and say, you know what? I have this position of how I think we should run a business. I have this position of how I think we should handle this project. But talking to somebody else, trying to make sure that you're right, may actually bring you to the place that maybe you might have not had all the information to think that you are right. And therefore, by taking in that information from somebody else, it can help you to actually make sure that you're right. And it might actually call you to come to the place and say, you know what? I didn't have all the facts. I didn't have all the ideas. And therefore, making sure that you're right is being able to have all the facts and all the details so that you stand in the right place more than being right. And some of us need to learn to be at that place, to learn to ask, to learn to confess, to learn to talk, to learn to come to the conclusions that are precisely right. And that is why it is important for you to interact with the word of God, to ensure that your opinions are right because God is never wrong and he can actually impact your thinking. He can impact your mind to make sure that you're right. And therefore we need to appreciate and understand that if our prayers are going to be effective, if our prayers are going to make a difference, we need to make sure that we learn and understand the ability of making it right. You see, I'm drawn right now to a man 
who had a nature like ours. His name is Jesus. I'm drawn to him right now because as I contemplate this sermon and what I'm trying to tell you, you know, we cannot actually be right unless Jesus Christ is the one who makes us righteous, unless he comes into our experience. And, and Paul talks about Jesus Christ in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 to 8. He says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus Christ had a nature like yours. He decided to take a nature like yours so that you and I can have a nature like his. <clears throat> He decided to take a nature like yours, like yours, so that you can have a nature like his. He decided to take your humanness so that you can take his divineness. He decided to take on human flesh so that you can be able to deal with your weaknesses, to be able to deal with your limitations, to be able to live a righteous life. And you and I can experience the nature of Jesus Christ when we say, Lord, I want to exchange my nature for your nature. I want a nature like yours. <laughs> I want a nature like yours, Jesus. I want to live like you. I want to talk like you. I want you to impact my life like how you impacted your, how you impacted humanity with your life. And today, somebody can take a nature like Jesus's. Somebody can experience his power so that his righteousness is imputed and imparted to you. So that, yes, you are this person who doesn't depend on your good works, who doesn't depend on your own strength, who doesn't depend on your own might and your own mind, who depends totally on him. And if prayer is to make a difference, that is what will need to happen. You need to give your nature so that you can take the nature of Jesus. And today somebody needs to experience that power and that change. Somebody today needs to say, Lord, I am coming and representing and presenting myself to you. Please accept me. Please take me because I want a nature, a nature like yours. And today, brother and sister, you can have a nature like Jesus. Today you can be like him. And when you pray, In the nature of Jesus, do you think your prayers will make a difference? I believe they will. And so, yes, just pray it, but pray in the nature of Jesus with his likeness and with his, with his power. And that's why I believe that Elijah, though he had a nature like ours, was able to pray because he took on God's nature. That's, that's the only way that we can actually live the Christian life. That is the only way we can actually pray. And today I'm calling you to take the nature of Jesus. Every head is bowed, every set of eyes is closed as we pray. Father God, you've spoken to us. We want a nature like yours. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be lifted and elevated like him. Please Lord, teach us. Please Lord, guide us. Into your loving hands, I humbly pray. Amen. I believe that that word did something for you because God's word goes out and it accomplishes something. I believe God has spoken to you in a specific and real way and you wanted to respond. You want to respond. You see, the good thing about God's word is that we always have an opportunity to respond in the ways in which he has spoken to us about. I don't know how God has spoken to you, but if your response is, I want to get closer to Jesus Christ, I want to give my life to him, I want you to connect with us. The number is right there on the screen. Please reach out. You can also reach out on social media and YouTube and other places, and we'd be more than happy to get back to you. May God bless you and strengthen you. And if at all that God has impressed your mind and your heart to make this ministry more impactful through your finances, please also give at the account number on the screen. 
I pray that God will continually bless you, that he'll strengthen you, and I'm going to see you very soon. Take care.